And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallachin Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease. ETP Canada. And now, here's Ted. Thank you, Becky, and welcome one and all to another edition of the Ted Wallachin Podcast. Today, a fascinating story about the BlackBerry phone, and specifically a three-part film which uh, takes us from BlackBerry's humble beginnings in Waterloo, Ontario, Canada, to its eventual demise along the way capturing, BlackBerry did, an amazing 45% market share. But what brought BlackBerry down is the question. Was it the Apple iPhone? outsourcing to China, a lack of focus on the part of one of its CEOs who was hell-bent on becoming the owner of an NHL team, or perhaps a combination of all. You'll see. BlackBerry the Film stars Jay Baruchel, Matt Johnson, and Glenn Howerton. Many will know who Glenn is from the hit television series, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. It is adapted from the book Losing the Signal, the untold story behind the extraordinary rise and spectacular fall of BlackBerry, written by Jackie McNish and Sean Silkoff. The film airs consecutively on three Thursdays, beginning November 9th on CBC, and streams on a number of other platforms. It's co-written by Matt Johnson and Matthew Miller. Mr. Johnson is also director, and Mr. Miller is producer, and Mr. Miller joins me now. Matthew Miller, it's a real pleasure meeting you. Thank you very much for taking the time this afternoon. Oh, thanks for having me, Ted. It's a real thrill. I have to tell you, uh, I, I loved, I loved the, the the film. It's it was I, I binge watched it. I went all, went through all three episodes in one night. I was going to do two, and then one night, and I, I couldn't stop. I I just I kept and then I was talking to a friend. I said, I said, are you familiar with the BlackBerry story? He says the phone. I said, yeah, he's a couple of years younger than I. He says, oh yeah, yeah, I know about that. And then I started mentioning things. He said, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. This is one of those deals where. People know about the story of BlackBerry, but the more you watch, the the more you realize how little you knew about it. There's so many different nuances, different things that happen, which which is what caught me off guard a little bit, which is why I binge watched it, because I just thought, well, I don't know what's coming up next. What happens next? Even though you know the ending, it's like it's like watching a film on John F. Kennedy. You know how it ends, but there's so much in between. It's a great film. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it was uh, it was quite thrilling to to make it. We shot it uh, last spring, uh, mostly in and around Hamilton, a little bit in Waterloo, and a little bit in London, Ontario, a couple of days in Toronto. But uh, it was a long time in the making, that's for sure. We uh, you know we hit a bunch of snags along the way because of COVID uh, and just yeah. and stalling and stuff. But uh, but we finally got to do it, and we shot it for about seven weeks last year. And um, yeah, the film premiered at uh, the Berlin Film Festival this past February uh, and got a great response. We were really thrilled with how it went. And the plan was always from the get go. In addition to the film, we were going to take the film and turn it into a three part series for CBC, uh, which we've done and which is going to start airing um, on November 9th. So mm-hmm. um, so it was really fun. But, you know, it struck me that we've now made this film and the series about Blackberry. And when we traveled with the film, like nobody knows this product is Canadian. Nobody knows this is Canadian. That was, my, that was my second question. How many people outside of this country are aware that BlackBerry is a Canadian invention? Nobody. And, you know, it was really interesting, especially in Europe, uh, just to see it was it was almost like as soon as they realized it was a Canadian company, their entire read on the device and the company changed. Right. Mm-hmm. Because they they had just been lumping it in. They assumed it was an American product. Um, but because it wasn't, the Europeans sort of like had a newfound respect for the BlackBerry, I would say, yeah. um, with this additional context. Well, it's interesting because there are there are some clips in the film where you see BlackBerry being used, like for example, in uh, in one in Curb Curb Your Enthusiasm, the great sitcom. Yeah, they talk about it because he's complaining. Was what are you always talking on that thing? You know, right, you know, writing things. What do I always? Yeah. And then there's another scene where there's Don Cherry's talking with Ron McLean about how great it is. And then Oprah Winfrey as well. And I was and thinking to myself, at that point, I thought to myself, does Oprah know that this is a Canadian product? <laughs> Maybe she did back at the time when she was giving them away to everybody in her studio audience. Yeah. But um, yeah, you know, it's funny. It was uh, one of the early ideas we had was, oh, wouldn't it be fun to show how our culture changed through popular culture? So early yeah. on in the series, we see, uh, you know, the opening credit sequence 
the first episode, we see clips from uh, movies and TV shows and commercials from the mostly the 90s, late 80s, but in this era, uh, really depicting different kinds of technology that already existed in our society. And mm -hmm. this is sort of, we wanted to show the baseline of where RIM was starting to come up from. And then mm -hmm. through using these other clips from Sex of the City and Curb Your Enthusiasm, we see the fast and immediate impact that they did have uh, yeah. on the culture because, you know, within a 10 year span, they went from this tiny little office above a bagel shop in Waterloo to having this huge um, factory in Waterloo and thousands of employees. And it, it just grew incredibly quickly. Um, and and the culture reflected that really, really quickly as well. So uh, it, was, it was fun to get to in include those little references. If you go way back, I mean, way, way back, would it be accurate to say that the genesis of the BlackBerry is Mike Lazaridis' high school teacher and a quote that he left with him? Uh, I think to a certain extent, the, the quote you're referring to um, is uh, the person who combines, uh, who, who puts a phone inside a computer will change the, sorry, who puts a computer inside the phone will change the world. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Mazinski, there, uh, Mike and Doug's uh, high school tech teacher. Mike was really like the prototypical boy genius. You know, he was, yeah. the, the, the uh, teachers would come over to his house, bring them their broken VCRs and ask him, to fix it, you know, like, like he was known as kind of really having a mind for, for tech and, um, you know, and he did have a really close relationship with this guy, Mr. Machinsky and, and him and a couple other kids, they'd go to his house in the basement and he had all these old computers. I mean, this is like the seventies, late seventies, early eighties. So, you know, nobody had this stuff. Uh, and he was an important figure and obviously saw the future. Um, you know, we adapted our screenplay from a book. Um, written by Sean Silkoff and Jackie McNish. It's, it's a yes, first book. Yes. And this story and, and that line is in the book. And so, you know, we never met Mike. So I didn't get to ask him, hey, did you have this idea before that? Like, how important was that line? But the authors of the book seem to think it was pretty important. And we just loved it. Yeah. Uh, and it very much sounds like the way people would have talked about technology also in the early yeah. 80s, right? Did um, you meet any of the three principals prior to filming? We only met... Jim and we only met Jim after the f film was complete. So completed. So we had a like a screening here in Toronto, I think in April, that uh, Jim attended and our cast attended. So we got, um, you know, Jim got to take some pictures on the red carpet with Glenn Howerton, who plays him in the film. And by that point, the film had already come out um, and screened at some festivals. And so there was an, an initial response to the film, and it was very positive, which I think probably helped us. Um, but Jim was a terrific sport and really a champion of the film. I, I think, um, you know, he sees it somewhat as satire and yeah. mm -hmm. the, the depiction of Jim a little bit heightened. Um, but, you know, he, he spoke kindly of, of the film. And, and, and again, I, I credit him for being a terrific sport. He wasn't one of the two creators. Correct. But he was the guy without him. Blackberry never would have become Blackberry because you needed the business guy. You needed the guy with the business savvy. You needed the guy with the connections to push it forward. The other guys were the tech guys. You know? 100 percent. They it was a great relationship because they both desperately needed each other. They, they were like the two best at what they do. But yeah, it's like if Jim didn't have the right product to sell, he mm -hmm. was never going to become Jim. And if Mike didn't have the right sales guy to sell it for him, he was never going to become Mike. Yeah. And because they just so happened to find each other at the right time, those are the best relationships. When you're in relationships with people who need you as much as you need them, what a wonderful place to be. Glenn Howerton does a terrific job uh, as, as, as Jim in, in, the, in the film. And he's the kind of guy, Jim Ball, Balsillie, when, when, you, when you're watching the film, you think to yourself, I mean, I did anyway, thinking to myself, God, I hate this guy. And then by the same token, God, this guy's brilliant. Because <laughs> you realize that without him, without him being kind of the dick that he was, it may not have, have, have happened, right? But unfortunately, he sort of turned out to be his own worst enemy. And he, I, I, I have to be very careful. I've written up so many different questions, but I don't want to give away too much. So I'm tempted sure. to ask things and say things, but that I'm going to back myself off. But so he's kind of a, the kind of guy you, you love to hate. Yeah, I mean, there's a history of these guys throughout, yeah. the, throughout movie history, you know, and I'd say especially in the last 25, 30 years, we've seen a lot of them, probably starting um, with Michael Douglas in, in Wall Street playing Gordon the Gecko. Yeah. 
who we use a clip from early, early in the movie. You know, we always joked that Jim probably watched Wall Street and, saw <laughs> and only like, like that was his hero, right? Like greed is good. Like, like he really subscribed to that and came up in that era. And, and he wanted to be one of those guys. Like he, he got an MBA at Harvard and I believe his plan was to go work on Wall Street. And then he kind of got uh, roped into this other company that we see him at the beginning of the series uh, working for before he eventually went to RIM. Um, but I think that's what he thought his life was going to be. And, and it's just sort of, you know, one of these funny accidents, coincidences in life that he ended up first working at that initial tech company, which is kind of what led him to, uh, to research emotion and to Mike. It can be... It can be a difficult process to follow because it's so technical, but you manage to write it to a level where people understand what you're saying. I'm not a t I'm a tech technical zero, so for me to understand exactly what you're talking about broad you know, broadband width and and, and those etc. I can, can't even come up with the terms, <laughs> but but you you made it you made it understandable. You made it pal palatable for 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 most people, which must well, have been a difficult you. task. It, it, it was, I could tell you, I think the reason you feel that way is because I am also a technical zero. Maybe I'm a technical one. Um, like <laughs> Matt and I, when we were writing this, we, we do not know that much about the inner workings of, of big business and we do not know much about technology. But we actually think that helped us write this because we were coming with a beginner's mindset. So we did not have mastery on these subjects. And so right. we're thinking, how can we convey this to an audience in a way that they can understand it? It's yeah. like, well, can we understand it? Let's let's let us understand it, and uh, as a, a, a sort of first basis. And so we spoke to some friends and colleagues we have who are computer engineers and scientists and people who know a little bit more about this stuff. And we would sort mm -hmm. of run. I'm like, well, could we say it like this? Would this make sense? Would you know? I remember when ER started in the nineties, you know, and all these doctors would come out and be like, this is, they're doing this all wrong. This is what, yeah, yeah. Of, of course, you know, they're doing yeah. it all wrong because they're actors and they're not trained doctors. And, you know, but it's like, we just need to get it close enough that we're not going to hurt the credibility of the whole thing uh, right. because, you know, somebody's sitting there saying, no, 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 it's not like that. Um, and again, there are, undoubtedly will be people who say that probably many of the people who worked at RIM in the engineering department back in the day, um, would say that, you know, we made a mockery of it, but, um, actually that's not entirely true that I got to tell you, we got to go to a screening in, uh, downtown Waterloo at the princess theater. Mm -hmm. They had about 400 former RIM employees. There is something like a reunion right. and, uh, and we got to screen the film for them. And we were so scared because we thought, oh, they might not like it or anyways, but they were so um, warm and generous in their praise and, and really had a, a great night. And uh, and so we got to meet a lot of these engineers afterwards who would regale us with other stories and anecdotes. They're like, oh, you should have put this in the movie. Or it's also funny that they all think they are in the movie. They're like, this guy was really me, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, sure. yeah. Yes. <laughs> What's interesting is, is that... Um, these people, these the three of them, the three main characters. I mean, the, you're talking about guys that are that are in their 30s. These, yeah. these are young men um, accomplishing things that older, wiser men are normally known to have accomplished, right? Yeah, what for sure. Think? I mean, what I can tell you about Mike and Doug is Mike dropped out of school university just before graduation, like a couple of weeks earlier. And he formed Research Emotion in 1984 with yeah. Doug and one other individual. And their first product was this thing called the Budgie, which is basically like um, they were trying to sell them to places like Kmart and Zellers. They're like uh, signs that you could get messages on wirelessly, right? Like like for retail uh, stores yeah. and stuff like that. And uh, that was sort of the origin of their company. So. Yes, they were young, but it was a good 12 to 15 years of kind of fledgling in the tech wilderness, mm -hmm. and a bunch of false starts before this BlackBerry device took off. And so I think in that period of time, they took their lumps and they probably learned an, an, off, an awful lot from their failure. Now, that said, they also had huge successes, just not financial successes. Mike Lazaridis, not a lot of people know this, is actually an Oscar winner. He's and an Emmy winner. He he won um, prizes from both the academy, um, uh, both academies in the U.S. 
for he developed like this edge code reader for 35 millimeter film back when movies were shot on film. And then this was like in the 80s. And they gave him like an honorary scientific Oscar, um, which we actually had our art department mock up and you can see in his office in a couple of the scenes. But, um, you know, they were accomplished individuals. And again, Mike, like from the time he was a child, was really this boy genius. Uh, but it just took them a little while to uh, to break through. Did he not, is he not responsible as well for uh, reinventing or at least uh, uh, inventing a new type of buzzer that was used for the television show Reach for the Top? This is Mike. Yeah, I think you're right. I I, I don't yeah. know exactly, but I think he was on his Reach team in high school. I, there's something, this sounds very familiar to me, Ted, that we uncovered this somewhere along in the research. It may even be in the book, yeah. but uh, I think you're right that that uh that he did design it was basically like a high school quiz show like jeopardy uh, yeah 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 there's, there's an interesting there's really two stories going on at, at, at one point when you you start in, and i love the way you introduce um jim jim's character as being somebody with a passion for hockey very subtly just to him sitting in his car listening to the hockey game as he's driving watching the hockey game as he's sitting at home suddenly you realize he's being interviewed by a headhunter after he loses his job. And he says, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And he looks at him deadpan and he says, I'm going to own an NHL team. And the guy laughed at him and he didn't laugh back. And that was his goal, um, to go purchase the Pittsburgh Penguins. And I, without getting too specific, because again, I don't want to give anything away, it's a fascinating process that he went through. In the end, it's a fascinating process as well. He, as far as, I mean, I guess I could say this, he went, he went and bought Cops Coliseum in Hamilton. Yeah, he was certainly trying. Yeah, I think he had the lease on it. It's, uh, you know, when when the book first came our way and we sort of first started talking about it, it was like the thing I knew the most about um, was the, you know, I think most Canadians, if you say, who's Jim Balsley? Most Canadians, I would say, know him more as the guy who couldn't buy an NHL team than the guy yeah. who was, you know, the CEO of BlackBerry, I would think. If you're a hockey fan, at least, yeah. Yeah. And uh, and so we, I always knew that should be part of this story. Oh, um, yeah. And it seemed to me, as an outsider, it's like, oh, they lost their company because he was distracted, uh, you know, and trying to buy an NHL team, which I don't think is in reality what happened. I think there are many factors, and, and but I do think it contributed to it. But what was really interesting for us is that for, as writers, is that there was so much documentation and, and written about Jim's foray into the NHL and trying to buy a team because it was all over the sports pages in our country for several years. Mm -hmm. And so there was a lot of just research floating around uh, that we thought was really interesting. And, you know, Jim loved hockey. He played hockey as a boy growing up in Peterborough. He went to games with his dad. Like, like he's always loved hockey. He still plays like hockey. Uh, now. And so it was something we wanted to kind of feather in so that throughout the, the series, so that if you don't know uh, Jim or anything about him, that towards the end of, of the series, when he starts to meet with Gary Bettman and try to buy an NHL team, we didn't want it to seem like it's coming out of left field. And we wanted to understand sort of this love of hockey. And we also didn't want to do it with like a rah-rah over the top. You know, you don't want to be the people making the Canadian movie that's also like insane over the top for hockey, right? Yeah. Uh, the so, last thing you want is because there's there's too many people who, who are anti-Canadian talent. I don't know why that is in this country, but but they are. They go, oh, that's just a Canadian presentation production. And you do that and it's like, oh, I see they got to bring hockey into it. Right. <laughs> so I know, I know what you're saying. We just, could have, just, look, I, I'm, I'm a basketball, I'm a passionate basketball fan. I wish Jim was trying to buy the Raptors. That I'm just look, looking over your shoulder. People can't see this, but there's you've got hung on your thing a poster of something called the Naismith International Park. I do. This is As a that's very... the Canadian who invented basketball. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's this uh, basketball writer. His name's Kirk Goldsbury, and uh, really into analytics. And uh, anyways, and and he, I think he's a cartographer hobbyist, and he designed uh -huh. this. And if you could see it closer, there's it's it's like a geographic map uh but it looks like half of a basketball court sort of right yeah i can see that now yeah yeah they're exactly. all labeled different 
places, Skyhook, Meadows, Visitor Center, stuff like that. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, we, uh, it's a cool I, just, I wanted to point that out. I know nobody else can see that, but I wanted to point it out anyway. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Attention all men, it's Black Friday, the absolute best time to restock your wardrobe. Hey, it's Ted Wallace and for Tom's Place. You know, it's always important to dress for success, and we have you covered from business casual to sports jackets to suits. Incredible deals starting now on lips and shirts, regularly up to $225 each for only $60. S. Cohen and other designer suits, regularly up to $650, slashed to $350, or an amazing two for $600. Plus, a huge selection of sports jackets valued at up to $6.95, now 50% off. On the second floor, we're also slashing prices on suits, sports jackets, dress shirts, and pants. Check out our website, toms-place.com, for details and more great deals. Tom's Place Black Friday Sale, on now in the heart of Kensington Market, 190 Baldwin. That's where you'll find Tom's Place, where we'll suit you. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend, Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 Three zero nine zero three eight seven. That's one eight six six three zero nine zero three eight seven. Or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca. That's info at etpcanada.ca. Yeah, what can I do for you? Okay, picture a cell phone and an email machine all in one thing. There is a free wireless internet signal all across North America and nobody has figured out how to use it. It's like the force. Sorry, have you seen Star Wars? No. That guy is sketchy. I don't think he's sketchy. The guy's a shark. I know how to market it and I know who we can sell it to, but I want 50% of the company and I've gotta be CEO. I don't know who you think you are, but deal. Are you joking? We are in a race to get this thing to market, and we are a year behind. I need a prototype. What do you call it? It's called a BlackBerry. Hmm. Huh. Try typing with your thumbs. Now back to Ted Walshin. I'm talking with Matthew Miller. He is the co-writer and producer of BlackBerry, which is available now on CBC Television. I think probably the best example that, that I can give uh, describing the difference between between Mike and Jim is one se- one sequence where where Bosley says perfection is the enemy of good because they wanted they needed to put out a prototype and and Lazarius wanted to do this thing perfectly. He didn't want to have some hack job fake prototype. He wanted a real prototype. And Bosley says perfection is the enemy of God and Mike says good enough is the enemy of humanity. Mm. I thought, what a great line. Is that for real or is that from you? That was, that was a scene Matt and I wrote. Um, okay. I mean, getting around these big ideas. Now, I do believe there's enough documentation to prove Mike thinks that way. And the reason yeah. that Blackberry became as important as it was and as popular as it was is because it was impeccably designed. And yeah. Mike really understood that. I mean, this is a central idea that... Matt and I grapple with all, all the time. Matt Johnson, who, who directed the film and who, who I wrote the script with, yep. you know, we've been making films together with, with, in our company for the last like 15 years. And you always have that struggle of, you know, it's, it's like, oh, should I leave this alone? Are we done? Is this draft done? Is this edit of the movie done? Like, is this the poster done? You always want to make it better, right? And it's like, 
it's kind of endless. You could keep working on something forever. And so it's that yeah. fine line about knowing when to let something go and say, you know what, it's, it's time to let this go out into the world versus, oh, but I still know how to make this better. And I think that's what Mike was feeling in that moment. He's like, I'm not just going to release some piece of junk because I know I could make it better, but you got to give me the time. And so I think that push and pull between the reality, the cost, all these things versus just the functionality and how good we can get this thing and wanting to do your best work. These are ideas that we understand really well because we face those every day when we're trying to make movies. Then there's the battle between Mike Lazarius and the COO of RIM, and I can't recall his name, about uh, outsourcing to China. Yeah, it's uh, he's played by Michael Ironside, a character named Charles Purdy. Yeah, yeah. great actor. Yeah, he is. Um, yeah, so this was another sort of central tension uh, at RIM around this time. Um, the, the, the idea, you know, what made BlackBerry so great at the beginning, part of what contributed it to it was they were all manufactured in Waterloo. Mike was overseeing it um, and he could do a lot better quality control. Um, but obviously there was an expense to that, making things overseas in China could be a lot cheaper. And so this is kind of a central tension that we play with throughout the film that starts fairly early where we start to understand Mike's feelings about stuff that is not engineered up to, to his standards. Um, and then it sort of comes to a head. That's sort of what Mike is dealing with uh, at the same time that Jim is off trying to buy into the NHL. Those two stories kind of um, parallel one another. There's another great scene in, in, in the film where, where, where Jim is on the phone. He's on a pay phone. Well, I don't know where you found that, by the way. <laughs> uh, he's, he's on a pay phone and he's having a, a, a very animated uh, discussion. Well, he's yelling and he's pissed sometimes. Sometime, um, just uh, I can't remember what it was who you're speaking to, but he's really pissed at the time. He ends the phone call by slamming the phone, the receiver against the, the, the base of the phone about six or seven times until the receiver is smashed. And I thought, oh, I, I love the symbolism here. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, you know, um, Jim breaks a landline in episode one, he smashes it, and then in the second yeah. episode, he smashes a pay phone. And we always yeah. felt like, oh, we should have seen him destroy a phone in, in episode three as well to bring it um, full circle. But when we yeah. shot that scene at the payphone with Glenn, um, he was so into that moment that he was like supposed to hang up the phone. That was the direction. It was like, just hang up the phone as hard as you can. Yeah. And then he just did that, but then he, he went nuts. Fever in his hand and he just kept going at it. And, uh, I mean, it, we could only do one take because he destroyed the phone. So, <laughs> so that was it. But, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, he had a way of channeling uh, Jim's energy and rage and uh, understanding what really drove him uh, in, in a really amazing way. If for, for people who, when they tune in for the first time and, and they look at uh, the character of Jim Balsillie, played by Glenn Howard, and you think, what do I know this guy from? This guy seems familiar to me. Well, if you've ever watched the, the great sitcom, it's always funny. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. That's where he's from. So what you got to do is I caught myself doing this because he, he shaved his, his head half bald because that's what Jim looked like, right? And so if you take your hand and you put your hand over his forehead and you look and go, oh, there he is. There's a guy from Always Sunny in Philadelphia. But he's terrific in, 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 in the movie, as is Jay, Jay Baruchel. The, the, the entire cast, I mean, and there's some, some, some excellent, excellent talent Um uh, Mark Critch is in the film as well. Saul Rubinick is in is 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 in the film. Plays a key role in in the film. Uh, for those people who are into uh, uh, old cars, you're gonna love some of the scenes with some of the some of the old cars that the the guys drive around because it's the film starts in what 1996, I guess, right? Yeah, it's the mid 90s. So so now the problem with shooting with some of those old cars is they don't drive so great. So that's. <laughs> But we were so thrilled with the cast we put together. I mean, we had um, Jay attached the project pretty early. And uh, I mean, he's he's fantastic as Mike. And uh, we loved working with him. And, you know, Glenn, we we didn't know at all uh, other than his work and his work on Always Sunny, as you mentioned. But he's like a Juilliard trained actor who sort of ended up creating and being on one of television's longest running sitcoms and having tons of success there. But I think when that happens to people, they kind of get pigeonholed. And it's like, oh, you're Dennis from It's Always Sunny. And yeah. that's who you are. 
And I think with Jim, what was really great about him as a character was that there was an, it's not a, it's not a tough leap from Dennis to Jim to figure out really that guy can do this. Like, I think we knew he could, but, uh, the humanity he brought to Jim and, and sort of like the steel and, and the, uh, quiet intensity that, that Glenn brought to the role is just like re- really amazing. And uh, we, we hope he gets a lot more um, opportunities like this because of. of- yeah, he, he deserves it. You're right. You're right. He, he definitely, definitely proves himself. To be, he's not, not a one dimensional actor at all. No, not at all. Sure. Um, the, one of the fascinating things about Balsali is, is his approach as a business person in terms of uh, putting together a company. He realized at one point, I got all these ragtag guys who were hanging around eating pizza in this, in this office that doesn't look like an office at all. It looks like a, like a, like a frat house, yeah. right? Uh, and he says, I'm going to need some key people here. And how do I get these key people? It's going to cost me a lot of money. And that really was one of the main things that brought him down in the end is the way he got them on board through stock options, which although he was never, he claimed, and and, and Balsam himself, himself, I I was reading reading an article about him. He claims, he says that they got it wrong in the film to a certain degree because we were never really charged with anything. That's right. The SEC came after us because they thought it was a little unscrupulous, but we were never really charged. Yeah, again, I mean, we could go back and, and look at the the transcripts and the records uh, of it, and and it might be somewhat just semantics around mm-hmm. what they were used. Um, I think so, but uh, but yeah, look, they they did get into some trouble. When I did this Q and A with Jim, somebody asked him about this, and and he sort of said, you know, um, he said, oh, we didn't know that we weren't allowed to do that, and then when we found out that we weren't, we stopped. Um, so again, you know, I'm sure the truth lies somewhere, somewhere there. So, so the, this, the discussion that happens when people who know a little bit about the history of uh, BlackBerry is, was it the iPhone that brought down BlackBerry or was it the management that brought down BlackBerry? I think it's a combination of both. Um, I think what, you know, and what we tried to show in the, in the series and, um, you know, I think that RIM, but... Mike's idea about the BlackBerry was we're going to take all this data, we're going to shrink it, pack it down tiny so that you could send your texts and your emails and it's not going to clog up the network, yeah. right? Because it was all about the network traffic that they were worried about. And what Apple and Steve Jobs and the people at AT&T were plotting at the same time was we're going to build bigger, better networks so that everybody can basically stream video on their phones and music and pictures and they they knew that they wanted to sell data because they they knew you know there's that line at the end of the the movie there's only one minute in a minute which the president of AT&T tells Jim Mm -hmm. sensibly telling him the days of selling minutes are over because there's a finite number of minutes there is no limit to how much data we can send it's infinite and so what an amazing market we've just discovered but I think because what they were doing was literally the exact opposite of what the BlackBerry device was designed to do, it was going to be impossible for them to recover because the, re- the, the reason BlackBerry was great was like basically the exact opposite reason about what was going to make iPhone great. Um, and I think that part of it was stubbornness and an inability to change or thinking maybe that they were there first and they knew a little bit better. Um, but again, I think it's many, many factors. Um, well, I, China, China well, didn't help in the end. China didn't help in the end. And I also think, you know, it's a great example of what happens when you have too much success too soon. Because again, it all happened very quickly, like less than 10 years from basically being in debt to Bank of Montreal for one and a quarter million dollars to, you know, being one of the most profitable companies in the world. So, it's inter- interesting to point out that when Jim Balsley came on board, uh, he had he had asked for a ridiculous uh, um, amount of um, he wanted with like ninety percent of the company, or whatever for like for, for like zero, and they eventually settled. They said, okay, we're going to give you thirty three percent of the company for one hundred twenty five thousand dollars. At that time, the stock valuation was I think five bucks. Yeah, something like that. It was pr- 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 pretty low. Yeah, um, and then by the at its peak. I don't know what the peak number was for the for the stock, but forty five percent of all phones were Blackberries. Yeah, they had that's a, incredible share. Incredible, yeah. It, it was uh, 
again, they were there first. There, there's so many different, so, so many beats that are not in the film about, you know, ebbs and flows and, and sort of like spikes in their growth, right? So one of the things that uh, we had in the second episode that we had to sort of take out for time was there was a whole storyline in and around September 11th, because what happened on 9-11 was all the cell towers went down in the U.S. and people couldn't communicate with one another. Right. But a couple senators had Blackberries. And so they were like in hiding in the basement of the Pentagon and their messages were able to get out and they were able to share information. And so within days of 9-11, Congress in the U.S. made these mandatory for government officials and employees so that because they had just proved that they could communicate when the cell towers went down. And so because of that, like Blackberry's uh, place in Washington grew almost overnight to because of circumstances they could not foresee. Right. And did was is not true that, that President Obama refused to give up his Blackberry at one point? Yes, quite famously. And, and again, very late. So, right. Obama's elected. Oh, oh, eight. Uh, and um, you know, still the prominent uh, iPhones out already, but Blackberry's the, for the prominent phone, especially in the business world. And yeah. by the time his first turn was winding down, they were trying to get him off his Blackberry, and he just he he was obsessed with it. I think he liked his cigarettes and his Blackberry. You know, he didn't want to give them up. Yeah, but, uh, but they, <laughs> I guess I guess Clinton would have been the first president to uh, to own a Blackberry, right? That probably makes sense. Yeah, you know. It's funny, another scene that we had in the film that was cut was this early press conference. I think it's like, I'm trying to think, I think it's 1993 and it was on the White House lawn and it was Al Gore and Clinton. And it was like, they had this, uh, I think it was an EO communicator. It was like an early uh, a, a precursor to like the Palm Pilot, basically. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, there's this video of like Al Gore writing hello over here on the White House lawn. And then it cuts to Clinton and he's getting the message over, over here, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and it was very exciting. And so we had a scene in the film where Mike was watching this happening and kind of this, uh, he knows everything that's wrong with the product that that the president of the United States is sort of commenting on how great it was. And that was yeah. an early scene we had in the film that, uh, that, that we took out. But um, yeah, Obama really did uh, love his Blackberry. And there was a while where celebrity culture, like everybody, loved their blackberries and you know we had a good time going through a bunch of old archival footage and seeing you know all these red carpets and just the, the way we see celebrities now with their phones but again their phones were blackberries did you ever own a blackberry i did i owned a blackberry for about five years i think yeah 2007 to 2012 yeah. sort, of, sort of on their downfall but again you know our movie ostensibly ends in 2007 and you know they were still a really important uh cell company for at least another five years like it, it's not like apple came out and just uh, crushed them immediately it, it was somewhat gradual well it's interesting we should point out as well that research in motion is, is a company that is still functioning in in waterloo as a matter of fact we were in the news the other day one of the uh, one of the executives i don't know if it was a ceo uh CEO, yeah. retired or resigned from from rim that's correct yeah the long-term ceo too um and uh, yeah, I don't know how much of a footprint they have in Waterloo. Like when we were there, we visited the campus and looked around, but I don't know how many employees they have in Waterloo now. I know a big chunk of their operation is in China, I believe. Yeah. It's it's a fascinating story, well told, well acted. Um, uh, for, for anybody uh, has any interest in technology, you'll be blown away by it. Um, the the insight that they possessed that that Lazarus possessed at, at that point in time is, is is quite phenomenal. I mean, I I didn't realize what could and could not been done at that time in terms of cell phones. To me, cell phone it was just it just a progressed right, and one became better, and one next one became better. But you you don't realize the kind of insight that that he, that he possessed. It's really quite fascinating. And in the end, they all turned out uh, okay. And the one person who really is the kind of the, he's like the Gilligan of Gilligan's Island, uh, which would be Doug Freegan, right? Because you he he's not as prominent as, as either um, Lazarus or uh, Balsali is. But in the end, it, things worked out best 
the best for him than anyone. I don't want to give too much. I get him yeah, yeah. stumbling here because I don't want to blow things. At the end of the day, and you know, Mike and uh, Mike and Doug are, are are still very active in uh, in Waterloo, uh, doing a lot of philanthropy in and around uh, tech and, and with the university there. And Jim's still really active, also doing a lot of philanthropy. So um, yeah, every, everybody got away unscathed. And uh, again, they're just you know. Canadian legends living among us every day. They change the one, world. One, one another great piece of irony, of course, is this is available here in Canada on, on CBC or for three consecutive weeks, and then it'll be streaming, I guess, on, on GEM. And it's available um, in the U.S. You can stream it in the U.S., including on Apple TV. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it's I awesome. saw that, and I thought, well, isn't that perfect? Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Matthew, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And congratulations uh, to, to the both of you for, for, for a great presentation. It's, thank it's, you so much, Ted. It was really a pleasure to talk with you. That will do it for another edition of the Ted Wallace Podcast. Thank you very much. Uh, you get a chance to watch this. I Really, I do highly recommend it. It's worth your while. And actually, you know what? When it's all over after the three episodes, after you've seen it, listen to the podcast again. You'll get a slightly different perspective to it. Uh, anyway... Go online, check out what you think, and leave your, your thoughts to us. Our website is www.tedwallishan.ca. And while you're online, you can fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You can change or even save a life. Have a great week. The Ted Wallishan Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease. The Ted Wallachian Podcast is produced by me, Becky Coles. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. For more information on this podcast and our sponsors, and to talk to Ted, go to www.tedwallachian.ca.